it's Rachel Hela. Welcome back to Coastal Insights Eyes on the Coast. I'm uh, Peter Underwood. I'm one of your co-hosts today and I'm tuning in from uh, the south of Vancouver Island in Wusinich and the Kwangan territories. And I'm Maureen, your other co-host, um, and I'm tuning to you live from the opposite end of the island, the very north end, uh, in the Kwakwakiwak First Nations territory here on the northern tip of Vancouver Island, beautiful British Columbia. Um, and like with every week, we would love to hear where everybody's joining from. Uh, so we have been so fortunate to get people from all over, as far as across the country and across the world. Um, so share with us in your channels, wherever you're streaming from, from YouTube or Facebook, uh, where you're joining from and all the different names of the area that you know of. And so while you're doing that, we're gonna welcome our live attendees to our broadcast studio. Um, we had a lot more, but I think things are dying down with uh, spring break coming up. So we have, I'm gonna welcome our first school and our, our only school for today, um, Sai, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, uh, we're Sai Pacific School of Innovation and Inquiry. And we just wanna say thank you so much. We're in Southern Vancouver Island in Victoria on uh, Wixanic and Lekwungen speaking people's uh, territory. So we wanted to say, hi Chika, thank you very much for including us in these presentations. Uh, we're, this is the third one we've been to and uh, it's really awesome. We're excited to, uh, to continue and, and learn about salmon as a keystone species. Ah, awesome, thank you. So yeah, we'll definitely be engaging lots with, with you in your group today as well as everybody else, but uh, thanks for being such a, a diehard fan of ours. <laughs> with you again. So let's go back. So Peter, you can share with us maybe some of the, the places these, everyone is joining from. Yes, we have someone here from Osanish territories, my homelands, and we have someone tuning in from uh, Scotland, UK. Thanks for all the comments. Uh, we got someone just who said Canada. Um, and I think we have one more class that's joining us. Okay, let's see. Oh, right, okay. I see McNair has just joined us. So let's give them a chance to introduce themselves. So McNair, if you wanna share with us uh, where you're from, what grade, and anything else. Hi. Hi, hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great, hey, thanks. So this is, uh, my name is Mr. Wolf, and this is my environmental science class. There's some grade uh, 10s, 11s, and 12s that are, are in this class. And we're, uh, we're live streaming you from uh, Richmond, BC, which is the unceded traditional uh, territory of the Coast Salish uh, and Musqueam Nation. Oh, awesome. Welcome. Yeah, I used to live in Richmond. I was from there. So glad to see a fellow Richmond School. Uh, yeah, so we'll be engaging with the with your classrooms as well, asking specific questions during this program. So hopefully you guys will be ready for that. So I'm just gonna teach you off for now. But yeah, welcome everybody. So this is lesson three or episode three of our Coastal Insight series. And if you're new to the series, if this is your first time, um, this whole series is focused on connecting people with our coastal uh, British Columbia of wildlife and habitats and the conservation issues. And this series is really focused on bringing all this uh, attention and information using a two-eyed seeing principle. And so that is blending indigenous knowledge and Western science knowledge systems together to be able to really open up the understanding of our world around us. So hence the two hosts, um, Peter and I, we're bringing in different learning lenses to be able to understand. So today's episode is focused completely on salmon. And so if you are from British Columbia or you've visited BC before, salmon is key on our coast here. It's embedded in, in the thread of our, our livelihood and our beings for a lot of people. And so today we're going to touch upon a lot of the, the things that make salmon so important on the coast, but also highlight a lot of our interconnections. Um, and some of the things that are impacting salmon. So right now there's lots happening with salmon populations um, and we wanna be able to see how we can sustain them for many years to come. So in our next slide, I just wanna point out, there's a couple different things that, sat, that make salmon really important on the coast here. So one, it's incredibly important for our ecosystem. So throughout this episode, we'll be chatting a little bit more about that. 
um, salmon has been such a, a strong cultural symbol on our coast for millennia. And so Peter will be sharing more about that as well. <laughs> and we have so much salmon in our diets. It's, it's a very healthy diet um, with lots of nutrients. And so it's a very important part of our, our food source. And lastly, salmon helps contribute to our local economy. So these are just some of the things uh, that salmon help contribute on the coast, but we'll, we'll detail more into that, into those things in a bit. Um, yeah, so last, and if you join us for our very first episode, um, we talked a little bit about what a biome is. So a biome is a larger area that's characterized by certain plants, animals with specific climate and weather. And so today we're gonna be looking more into an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is within a biome. So if you go into a biome, there's lots of different ecosystems. So an ecosystem is a community and interactions of living and non-living things together. So in this next slide, um, it's just an example of an ecosystem. So for example, if you think about the tide that comes in and out of the, the ocean, in the water and the shoreline, and there's lots of different pockets of landmass. Sometimes when the tide goes out, you have these little tide pools. And if you look really closely and just sit beside a tide pool, uh, which I highly recommend, you'll see all these living creatures moving around. You see these interactions um, in this little bubble of life. And so this little bubble is considered an ecosystem. So that's an example. And we have tons of different ecosystems throughout our different biomes and areas that we live. Uh, so this next slide uh, just kind of demonstrates a lot of different species. And there are certain species that are, are very important in, uh, in the way an ecosystem works, um, such that if you remove one of these species called the keystone species, it can have a huge impact on the environment. So we're going to look at a major keystone species. So just as an example, we're going to divert a little bit away from salmon for a second, just to give an example of what a keystone species really is and how it can impact an ecosystem. And this is done with an example, a classic example on the coast, with sea otters. So these guys are really hard to resist. They're cute, adorable faces. Um, I love just, look, yeah, just looking at sea otters just make me smile. So I had to put one more picture, uh, this next picture, just so everyone can put a smile to your face. This cute little. So cute. <laughs> the baby on the sea otter. Um, but they are the smallest marine mammal on the coast here. And they have the densest fur of all the mammals. So in this next picture, it just shows a little sample of what the fur looks like. But if you were to touch one finger on that sea otter fur or sea otter pellet, that spot that you touch would have more hairs than all the hairs on your head. So the fur is incredibly dense. Um, and they don't have blubber like a lot of the other marine mammals to keep them warm. So it's just their fur that keeps them warm. So that's why it's super dense and compact. And it was actually very coveted um, and very expensive. So people would hunt for sea otters. And so back in the day, they were very heavily hunted. Um, and they were hunted to the point where they completely disappeared off the coast of British Columbia. And so when a species goes extinct in a certain area, um, but not the rest of the world, it's called extirpated. So it was extirpated from British Columbia and it created a huge impact in our environment, as you'll see. So in this next slide, it's showing a cute little sea otter eating a sea urchin. So they are one of the few predators that can can um, utilize this food source because it's very spiky. But sea otters are clever in that they use tools. So they have rocks that can pound open hard things like shellfish or sea urchins. And so they love to eat sea urchins. Um, so if you have ever encountered sea urchins, um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. They're found at the bottom of the oceans or they're found in the ocean. But sea urchins love eating kelp. And so this is just a picture of a kelp forest. So full of life. A lot of marine mammals like to hide in them and fish. It's great habitat. 
So if you think about a forest, it's kind of like a forest underwater. So it's this great ecosystem. It's really rich and thriving. So when the sea otters disappeared, they're a keystone species. So remember, they have a really important role. And so when they disappeared, um, something happened. So in the next slide, I'm just going to show sea otter or sea urchins eat kelp. So they'll just graze the bottom and they kind of eat the stipe or the stem of the kelp um, and basically clear cut them. So when the sea otters disappeared, the sea urchins exploded. And so they didn't have a predator to eat them. So they would just take over and they clear cutted a lot of kelp forests. So basically where there used to be tons of life, lots of thriving ecosystems and communities um, turned into these dead zones. And so that's just an example of what could happen if a keystone species is removed because they have a very large role in these ecosystems. Um, so fortunately for us, salmon, oh, sorry, this one last slide. Um, so this map shows basically the historic range of sea otters. So if you look at the, the yellow um, highlighted all on the coast of BC, they used to be found all over the coast. And then the red, is highlighting where they're found now. So because they disappeared from BC, um, there was a big project to translocate them from Alaska. So in the late 60s, early 70s, they had a big project to translocate sea otters from Alaska all the way down to BC. And so they were slowly introduced. And so now slowly they're coming back to our coast. So if you are lucky enough um, to have seen one, that's, uh, that's really great because they used to be completely um, gone from our coastline. So if you go to the west coast of Vancouver Island, you'll see some more. But yeah, so now um, moving back into salmon, we're really lucky because salmon have not disappeared from our coast. Um, there's a lot going on with them, but we haven't had that example where the sea otters um, demonstrated uh, what could happen with the ecosystem. So I'm just going to ask, some of the classes that are live streaming. Um, if you know of any of, if you want to name some of the Pacific salmon that we have on our coast here. Okay, so, and those of you who are joining live as well, share with us if you know um, some of the species that we find here on the coast. So we have five oceanic species that we find in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, let's go to Sai. I'm going to ask you guys first. You guys know any salmon species? Pink salmon. Pink salmon, yeah, excellent. Oh, <laughs> Perfect, yeah. So pink salmon is one of them. So we have five. Let's see if, oh, there's another class that just joined us as well. Let's see McNair. Do you guys know any salmon? Yeah. They the Chinook salmon. Chinook, yeah, awesome. Hey. Okay, any others? <laughs> Anyone else from this class? Yeah, we got sockeye salmon. Sockeye, sweet. Okay, sockeye, Chinook. Okay, I'm gonna ask this one last class. Brooks, Brooks Science just joined us. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear us. Can you guys hear us? We can. Okay. Do you guys know another salmon species that exists on the coast here? Coho cutthroat. Coho cutthroat. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay, I think everyone. I think we got most of them. Chum, Chinook, pink, sockeye, coho. Okay, so Peter, go ahead and show the rest of the oh, salmon. So we got no. Chinook, pink, sockeye, coho, and chum. And so those are kind of the common names, but if anybody knows other names for them, because there could be many names that people refer to these fish by, please share in your chat um, what, the, what the different species names are that you, you know them of. And then Peter, maybe you can share some names yes. that you know them by. I know them in Sanchothin. Uh, I know some of them at least. Uh, and yeah, let us know if you know any indigenous names for it or any kind of connections between indigenous names in English or other kind of introduced languages. Uh, in Sanchothin, though, uh, we would have uh, Chinook would be a Stokwi, uh, and then Chum would be a Kwa'atlu, Koho is Thaitwen, Sokka is Thaki. And pink is Hanan. And uh, there's actually kind of a neat trick to, to learning the names of salmon too. Um, 
I just recently learned this. You can use your hands. So on your hands, uh, you can remember because you can start with uh, your thumb, uh, and you can remember that one of the salmon is chum because it rhymes with thumb. Uh, your pointer finger, uh, it can like poke poke something out, poke an eye out. You can remember sock eye. So careful with your with pointing. Uh, your middle finger is the the tallest finger. Uh, so that's it could be like the king or um, like spring salmon, like Chinook. Um, then your ring finger uh, can like you can remember that because like the, the rings can be silver, like a uh, silver fish, uh, also known as coho. I remember it more because a ring is kind of like an O, and coho has two O's in it. Uh, and then last is your pinky. You can remember pink salmon. Uh, so that's how I remember. Uh, the kinds of salmon that we have around here uh, with that neat trick. Uh, I'm going to tell a bit of a story next, uh, a story on salmon. So the, um, like salmon is, is really huge in Coast Salish cultures. It's been huge in kind of uh, our economies uh, and kind of as a food source, really huge in, in that. People have like, you know, uh, smoked or, or dried or preserved salmon in many ways and have used it for uh, like gifts or for trading, and I know a lot of people that still do that. Uh, I have some friends that have uh, gifted me some salmon, and uh, I've gifted some some salmon a little bit and some food. Uh, so it's it's still huge in our economies today, and uh, very valuable food to us with a lot of significance in, in history and our culture. Uh, the story I'm going to tell is uh, called. Um, I'm going to read it from a book. It's called How the Salmon Got People, read by uh, Johnny Claxton from Sayouts, uh, late Johnny Claxton. Um, it's from a book called The Wasanich and Their Neighbors. Um, I've heard the story kind of told uh, in person a few times too. Uh, this kind of story is called a first generation story. So if you're following the worksheets, this is going to be one of the vocabulary answers. So I'll give you that right now. This is a first generation story. Um, so, I'll, yeah, without further ado, uh, I'll read uh, the story. Once there was no seals, so the people were starving, the Wasanich people. Uh, they lived on elk and whatever game they could find and kill, like on the land. Um, two brave youths said to each other, let us go and see if we can find any salmon. They embarked in their canoe and headed out to sea, not caring in what direction they traveled. They journeyed for three and a half months. Then they came to a strange country. They reached uh, for the shore and a, a man came out when they reached shore and welcomed them saying, you've arrived. We have arrived, the, youth, the youths answered, though they did not know where they were. They were given food to eat and after they had eaten, their host let them outside the house and said, look around and see what you can see. They looked around and saw smoke from Kakmin. That's a, uh, uh, indigenous kind of medicine. It's seeds from this plant that comes out in the summer uh, and you can burn it uh, like smudging. It's a, it's a cleansing smoke from these seeds of uh, kakmin. Uh, they saw the smoke that the steelhead, sockeye, spring, and other varieties of salmon were burning each for itself in their houses. The youths stayed in place in this place for a month. Their hosts said to them, you must go home tomorrow. Everything is arranged for you. The salmon that you were looking for will muster at your home and start off their journey. You must follow them. So the youths followed the salmon for three and a half months. They traveled day and night with the fish. Every night they took the kakmin and uh, burned it with the salmon so that they might feed on the smoke and sustain themselves. Finally, they reached Discovery Islands where they burned kakmin along the beach uh, for their hosts uh, and said to them, uh, burn kakmin along the beach when you reach land to feed the salmon that travel with you. Then if you treat the salmon well, you will always have them in abundance. Now that they had plenty of salmon at Discovery Island, they let them go to other places, to the Fraser River, Nanaimo, and all around Coast Salish territory and further. Uh, because their journey took them three and a half months, Salmon are now absent on the coast for that period each year. The coho said to the other salmon, you can go ahead of us. We have not yet got what we wanted from the lakes. That is why the coho always are the last of the salmon. The young men now had a salmon, but no good way of catching them. The leaders of the salmon 
a real man and real woman taught them how to make uh, swahla, the reef nets, and how to use kakmin. They also told the young men how their people should dress when they caught the salmon and that they should start to use their reef net in July when the berries were ripe. So today, when uh, the Wasanich people dry their salmon, they always burn some kakmin in the fire or on the stove top and they put a little in the fish when they cook it. Also, when they cut up salmon before inserting the knife, they pray to the salmon that they may always be plentiful. Uh, I tell these kind of stories, um, and I've been told these kind of stories because they're really important in kind of knowing how uh, us as people should have a relationship with um, the nature around us, our other relatives, our relatives in the sea, our relatives on the land. And uh, one thing that's kind of uh, really represents that, shows, like demonstrates that, is uh, our, our names for them. We have names for, for of course, all the salmon, but we also have, a, as for Sanish people, there's a prayer name for these, uh, for our relations. So for salmon, we would call them our brothers and sisters. And uh, we call them that because um, it's really to show that we're related and we only need to take what we need and that, that these salmon are giving themselves to us. As a, as a gift. Um, the same way, um, kind of, we have a prayer name for um, for deer. Deer would be a smyeth, but the prayer name would be the uh, the same name for your grandson or granddaughter. So we call them that because it's it's such a gift for them to be to be giving them themselves to us, so that we can sustain ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's that's an example of a first generation story. Uh, next, we have a, a salmon quiz. I'll let uh, Maureen come take us through that. All right. Thanks, Peter, for the beautiful story. Um, yeah, salmon is super important. So just to start off, we're going to do a little quiz, and everyone can play along as well. So if you know the answer, uh, just type it in the chat. Um, and I'm going to go to the classroom to see if you guys know the answer and, and, uh, and put you on the spot. Sorry. But... Um, First question, which is the largest salmon of the five oceanic species? So the five that we just uh, listed earlier, um, which one is the largest? I'm gonna pick a school, McNair, okay. What do you think, McNair? Chinook. You are right, yes, Chinook is correct. So Chinook is the largest and they can weigh up to 100 pounds, but on average, they might be about 30, but it is the largest um, and the favorite of the resident killer whales. So Chinook is a very special species or, of salmon. Okay, or king, yeah, they're also known as king um, or spring. Some Somebody mentioned earlier tai as well. I've heard that for Chinook salmon as well. Or hookbill, blackmouth, there's lots of different ways to say them. Okay, next question. Next question. How long do salmon live? Ooh, and that one might not be one answer. Let's, I'm gonna go to Brooks Science just to put you guys on the spot. You can take a guess too, it doesn't have to be. Um, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but what do you think? How long do salmon live? A year. So it's way more than a year. Five years? Five years? Three years. What's your final answer? Three, three. Three years. Okay, yeah. So that's within the range. So it can be anywhere from two to seven years, depending on the species, depending on their life. Um, but average, yeah, maybe three to four years. Okay. Can Pacific and Atlantic salmon interbreed? Hmm. So let's go to Sai just to complete the process here. What do you guys think? <laughs> Can Pacific and Atlantic salmon interbreed? Oh, I think you're right. Think yes. You think yes? Yeah, okay. and, and that it's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> okay, let's see some of the comments. Anybody guess from the comments? Okay, well, from what I've heard, they cannot interbreed. I mean, there might be some like special cases that are coming out now but they have different numbers of chromosomes and so apparently they can't interbreed okay can salmon smell Ooh. 
I'm gonna go back to McNair again, just because you guys are our live audience. So we're gonna put you on the spot. What do you think? Can salmon smell? Yes or no? Uh, oh, well, there's a lot of uproar, a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, comments on both ways for that. So I think, uh, let's see, the loudest <laughs> voice is gonna be oh, Let's hear it. Yes, but no, I think they said. <laughs> yes, but no. <laughs> this is a hard question. Who knows, can they smell? The answer is yes, they can actually smell really well. Um, and we'll find out what they need to use that smell for later. But if they can smell the equivalent of, let's say, a drop of odor in 10 Olympic sized swimming pools. So they will be able to smell that. So they have actually a really good sense of smell. I've actually heard they can smell just as good as sharks, which is uh, saying something about how good sharks smell, but also how good salmon smell. Yeah, who knew? Now you do. So next one, true or false? Once adult salmon return to fresh water, they do not eat. Is that true or false? What do you think? Let's say Brooke Science. Science. True. 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 False. Final answer. <laughs> Everyone's flip flopping. The answer is true. Yes, they do not eat. Um, yeah, some audience members got it. So true, they do not eat, and it could be six months, but they uh, they transfer their body fats to gametes and, and focus on reproduction, so they don't eat this whole time. They return to fresh water. Okay, last one. Place the following life cycle in order. Okay, so Peter, we'll go to the next slide, and this is just for everyone to take a look at. We're gonna have to put it in order. I'm sure you've probably encountered this many times. The salmon life cycle. I'm gonna ask Sai School, you guys, for the final answer. We can you can take a second just to kind of soak it in, and then let me know your final order. Okay, Are you guys ready? Okay, what do you think? <laughs> Gabe's had to unmute. Okay, go for it. Row. Yeah. Row. Yeah. Uh, Fry, I think. Fry. Oh. Okay. Not okay. And then? Uh, Alvin. Alvin. And then? Uh, uh, smolt. Smolt. Adult and spawner. There you go. All right. Okay. Let's go to the next slide, Peter. So, you got, you, you got it really close. There was only one little slight mix. So the row is first, and then no. next is the oh. alvin. So they have the yolk sac. So that's where they're still kind of dependent on the yolk. They're still in their nest. And then they turn to little fry, little tiny fish. Then they turn to smolt, bigger fish. Adults, they go into big bad ocean. And then they turn into spawners, come back to the rivers. And then they lay their eggs and the cycle continues. So this whole cycle, um goes through freshwater and salt water so they spend some of their time freshwater some of their time in salt water so the next poster actually um is a really good one i like to oh everyone got all of the well, answers i could so answer everyone yeah so this one is a great poster just to to have as a resource um and i'll share with you how you can get it for free if you want to order one but i'm just going to show it in full so you can look at it but we mentioned they start out as eggs so at the top of the oops i'm going back at the very top of the the uh picture they'll start out in these nice rivers or streams and then they'll make their way down they're gonna get bigger and bigger and then in the next slide yeah they'll kind of make their way down now this river turns into the ocean so it joins in with the ocean and when fresh water meets salt water in this in this type of area this is called an estuary and so now these salmon have to really acclimate and kind of get ready for the ocean environment so not all species can do that so it's really specific and very special and so these fish are called anadromous fish where they can live in freshwater and oceans and then they make it out to the big bad ocean where they live their life for several years, who knows what they do? They go on adventures and then they'll come back to the exact same stream. And this is where their sense of smell is really important, it's key. 
Um, so throughout that journey down their stream, they uh, really imprinted different smells. They know exactly which stream they came from and they go back to the exact same stream magically. Um, so it's, it's amazing nature and what they can do. But yeah, we'll come back to this poster in later just to di the, dissect it a little bit more. Um, but oh, I'll just actually share with you if you do want this poster, which is a really great one to have, um, it's really big and it's great to examine. But if you want one for free, um, just email Joanne Day at dfompo.gc.ca. Uh, and we'll have this on our resources as well. But you can get a poster for your class or your group, which are really great resources. Okay. All right. The, uh, the salmon also, they, uh, each salmon kind of has their own pattern of uh, going through like their life cycle at different times of year. And uh, in Pusinich history, it's been observed that the patterns followed uh, this kind of pattern um, for, yeah, lots of years throughout history. Um, this is the 13 moon calendar. For, the, for those of us that uh, kind of tuned in on our first episode, we talked a little bit about this and showed this. Um, but now that we're talking about salmon, we can really start to notice the salmon on the edges. There's four salmon um, kind of surrounding this calendar. This calendar is kind of broken up in a different way, like a, like a pie or a pizza, different than like a Gregorian calendar, because uh, it, it's cyclical, just like the year. Uh, like the year kind of cycles this way throughout. So if I zoom in to the top half, uh, you can see the salmon a bit more, and you can see some of the words. Uh, the first line is the Sanchothan words uh, for these these moons or months. On the bottom, um, it's the same thing. But if we look close, we see here there's a Chenthaki. Uh, that's right around the time of June, but not exactly because they don't line up perfectly. That's the moon of the sockeye. Uh, this the sockeye here. Then if we look at July, there's a uh, Chenhanan, the moon of the pink salmon. Um, and then later on in the summer, we have uh, uh, Chenthewen, the moon of the coho salmon. And just like I said earlier, the, the coho let the other salmon go first uh, since they didn't get what they needed from the lakes and the, and the rivers. Uh, and then the last salmon month is uh, Chenkwalu, which is September around that time of year. Uh, the moon of the chum salmon and uh, I really like to bring up the 13 moon calendar because it shows a pattern that's been followed for thousands of years but now we're starting to see a shift in the in that too so because of climate change some of the ocean currents have, have shifted and that confuses the salmon so they don't always know when it's their time to come back to the their homelands for spawning um, so their their patterns have kind of shifted over the years um, and it's really important that we kind of look at this calendar because it shows shows what's kind of been followed and and what what patterns there are in place. Um, then yeah, now I'll be talking a little bit about uh, some traditional indigenous fishing methods. Uh, these are like some images that are from a paper that Andrea Reed was a part of with some other you know scientists. Uh, the The paper is called "Indigenous Systems of Management for Culturally and Ecologically." Resilient Pacific Salmon Fisheries. Um, yeah, so if any of you like recognize these, let us know in the comments of uh, if you've seen any or if you uh, what kind of traditional fishing methods you've seen and maybe where you've seen them too. Um, we have dip nets, which is a pretty classic way of fishing. Uh, dip nets are ubiquitous, effective, and simple ways of catching migrating salmon. Most effective at narrow canyon canyons and cascades where the fish are concentrated along the shore. Dip netting sites are often passed down through families for generations. Then there's uh, fishing weirs, which are fences built across rivers that channel salmon either into a trap or narrow channel where they can be easily caught. Uh, these, be, these can be really huge in scale across like a, a pretty big river. Um, you see these a lot, a lot on the mainland, but they're also on Vancouver Island too and, and Kosilish communities, um, you've seen them less now than you would have like decades ago, um, but they're still around. Uh, and then another traditional fishing method is um, fish traps. 
They're, they're built adjacent to the river mouth uh, to catch staging salmon as they wait to move into the river. Fish move to shore when the tide is high and are, they're stranded behind a wooden or um, stone trap walls when the tide subsides. So the tide is kind of doing the work of, of catching them with the, with the kind of gate that they have. Uh, then there's fish wheels. They're a stationary fishing technology powered by the flow of the river. You kind of see how it, uh, the currents can move the wheel. Um, the wheel spins with the current, scooping the fish out of the water and dropping them into a holding box unharmed. You see the little holding box in front of the, the figure of a person. Uh, then there's reef nets. Uh, reef nets capture migrating salmon in the ocean and are effective in locations where salmon migrate through shallower water. The upstream ends of the nets uh, leads are anchored to the bottom of the ocean funneling salmon into the heart of the net. The net is then lifted out of the water, allowing fishers to selectively harvest salmon and at least non-target species. Uh, that's kind of very opposite to um, trolling or, or other kinds of uh, newer fishing methods where people kind of take all everything in the ocean, scoop it up, and then uh, anything that's not the target species, like say they're fishing for a certain type of uh, salmon or fish, um, um, like reef net fishing is where they would take out the fish that they don't want and release them back in right away so that there's no kind of food or fish wastes. The, uh, yeah, the reef nets are, are really huge in, in kind of Wasanich and, and Straits Salish culture, uh, like a specific part of Coast Salish territory, uh, especially to, to the Wasanich because we're known as like the saltwater people. We don't have a, a large river to get our salmon to have kind of the same fishing methods that I listed earlier. Um, and reef nets are, are great because uh, they can catch migrating salmon and wherever Sandwich territory is is perfect because there's a lot of salmon passing through to get to the, the big mainland rivers. Um, and yeah, the word for reef nets in Sinchothan is uh, swachla, swachla, uh, I believe. Um, and that comes from the, the word for willow. Uh, and willow is the kind of Willow is what they used. They used the willow bark to make the rope, uh, the really strong ropes um, in making the, the nets. And that would take a lot of time, but the ropes would be strong enough to catch all the salmon and to bear the loads. And the people that kind of designed the, uh, the reef nets and upkept them and everything were really brilliant people. And uh, it takes a really sharp mind to kind of design these and to, to work on these because you're basically engineering it. Uh, you have to consider, you know, the tides, the winds, the ocean currents, uh, time of day because of the tides, um, and the strength of the rope and how much give and hold there is in, in different areas. Uh, this kind of technology is, is a really powerful traditional method. Uh, and I've even been told that like reef nets, like people have had the ability to overfish the oceans uh, for centuries. Uh, but you know, salmon populations have been healthy over the years up until recently. Uh, so we've We've known that uh, reef nets are a powerful fishing method, but there's a lot of sustainability kind of uh, like pedagogies and, and mindsets kind of in place when fishing. Uh, right at the end of the, of the nets where it's kind of like bowing a bit, there's an opening to let some of the salmon pass through. And that's the, an effective way to kind of ensure that not all the fish are caught. Um, another thing that I've heard is that there have been Kind of big celebrations after the first like sockeye catch uh people like sandwich people have traditionally um you know celebrated the first catch of the season and once that celebration kind of starts then people would not fish for like a week to 10 days and allow like the the bulk of the first kind of set of salmon to pass through to get up into the the rivers in the mainland and to get where they need to go uh and that's another way to kind of ensure that there's another like if there's enough salmon population kind of making its way through without being over harvested uh, and there's quite a few kind of ways where we can compare and contrast uh, you know indigenous tradi uh, traditional fishing methods with uh, the newer western fishing methods and um, how to keep it sustainable uh, so i'm going to put a challenge out there for everyone to to research the differences and compare and contrast traditional indigenous management systems with contemporary management systems. And uh, you kind of see at the bottom, <clears throat> let me get my laser out. Uh, you see here, there's like 
with mixed stock, uh, all the salmon are kind of coming at a similar time, but if salmon have their own distinct runs, there's uh, salmon coming at different times of the year. And that means that you can kind of focus more on, on each species and, and that they're, you know, there's going to be salmon throughout the season, not just all at once. Awesome. Yeah, I feel like there's so many lessons that we can learn just from looking at traditional fishing methods and the ideas and principles behind them. Um, just the understanding of sustainability and, and how even though there was an abundant source of fish, not everything was taken. It was only what was needed. And so that's why to what seen is really important just to be able to, to look at these different different methods, different ideas, different perspectives, and be able to incorporate it into what it's known, uh, what's known today, to be able to approach conservation and approach ways that we can live sustainably with all these these amazing creatures in our, in our environment. So yeah, so things to really think about. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll visit this poster again, because I love it, and there's so much to learn from it. So I'm just gonna make sure you can see it as clear as possible, but see if you can look very carefully, okay? This is kind of like that book, Where's Waldo? If you've ever tried that mm -hmm. when you were younger um, and looking closely at the different things that are going on to try to spot out certain things. But the journey that salmon make can be very, very long. And throughout that journey, there are a lot of things that want to eat it and a lot of things that threaten it. Um, and prevent it from completing its journey. So I want you just to take a look at this poster again and just try to try to point out or try to um, identify all the different animals that are eating the salmon along the way. So it can be when they first come out of their nests as little tiny juvenile fish, fry, smolt, um, all the way to adults. But just take a look at this picture and see what other animals you can you can identify eating salmon. I'm just gonna go and you can chat, to, uh, share with me what animals you see there uh, eating the salmon and share it in the chat. I'll go to the classrooms and see what animals you guys can list in here. Let's go to, uh, let's go to McNair School. Let's see, what animals do you think are eating that salmon along the way here? All right, so we, we, heard, we had, uh, I think three that were mentioned. I'll let them call it out again. Okay. Um, bear. Bear, yeah. And the human fishing. And the human fishing. And the human fishing, yeah, that's a big predator. So bear, humans, cool, okay, good spotting. Let's see, Brooke Science. Did you guys spot anything in that picture? It's an uh, eagle. Yeah. Dogs, wolves, wolves, wolves. Dogs. Yeah. Okay. Fish. Fish. Yeah. I'm gonna. Okay. Um. So yeah, we have eagles. We have other fish. Um. I'm gonna go to Sai. If you wanna list any last last predators you see in that picture. What else we got? Mm -hmm. Well, we saw from the previous slide there were some other, or sorry, the other half of that poster, there were some other animals. Yeah. We saw that there was um, some orcas. Oh, yeah. And yeah. tuna. Yeah. And um, fish boats. <laughs> yeah. Yes. More humans. And I think, um, I don't know if they were there, but um, seals and sea lions. Yeah, they were in there as well. So excellent. Yeah, so we'll, we'll try to point some of these out. So Peter, if you want to highlight some of the, along the path, this one, I and mean, this is just half of the poster, but yeah, we got eagles, bears, a bird there, some kind of uh, river otter maybe, looks like a raccoon, I think. Uh, and then there's grizzlies, other bears, human, great blue heron. Um, and then these are just the, the wildlife that are eating salmon, but there's also different threats. So Peter, do you want to just maybe highlight some of those things? Yeah, some of the threats that we can see um, are things like this, let's see, put the laser on, uh, this kind of quarry here. 
that's pretty close to the water. So I'm sure that uh, some of the maybe blasts will kind of spill in here and, and anything else that they're kind of using in like any industrial materials could affect the, the water's health. Um, another thing is logging. With logging, um, the trees aren't really holding the earth together. So if there's any like landslides that'll go right into and that might take along any uh, kind of like man-made materials or anything that's not supposed to be in the water going in there. It could also really uh, fill the water with like uh, kind of earth and shift the way the river flows. Um, let's see, there's, uh, I guess there's like someone fishing, so maybe they could, you know, leave some of their lunch behind or, or something. Um, what else? Do you, do you see anything I'm missing? No, I mean, there's, yeah. Like as soon as trees get removed from the that river bank, it cools off the water and changes the temperature of these rivers that are very specific. So everything is really intricate and connected. Um, we'll go to the next half of this poster and we'll just highlight some of these, some that were mentioned, a lot of the predators and different things in there. So we had um, some ducks or some birds. We had, what else is in there? Oh, another person fishing, some more birds some seals and marine mammals, definitely some fishing boats. So out in the ocean, there's other predators, bigger fish, tuna, and of course, killer whales. So lots of killer whales eating salmon and eagles. So times throughout the whole journey, um, there's mm -hmm. lots of eagles eating these salmon on its way out and back. Um, any other threats in here? Yeah, we see uh, there's a farm, like sometimes fertilizers or insecticides or herbicides um, that are close to the shore could leach into the ocean. Uh, let's see, we got something being tugged along here. Uh, any spillage from that could affect the uh, water's health. Of course, boats uh, also the same. Um, what else? We got this, what is this, like a, a huge factory on this tiny island? That doesn't seem, seem too safe. Um, the island's so small, it could the water could come right up there and, and swallow the whole little factory almost. There's a whole city here too. Um, you know, with cities, like people might toss something in the drain that will go right into the ocean or um, like a car might crash into the water um, and that, you know, can really impact the water's health. There's a little dock here with that. There's also like a lot of safety that needs to be considered. Uh, and again, another farm and with farms like, uh, you know, insecticides, herbicides, um, Anything that's like an industrial farm kind of material could leach into the water too. All right, so, oops. Okay. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, so there's tons of eggs that get laid. Um, when a, a salmon spawn, so it'd be anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000. But I want you to take a guess. So of 2,000 eggs that are laid, let's say, for example, how many of those eggs do you think will make it through that whole life cycle and come back to spawn again um, as a next generation? So what? how many eggs do you think will complete its life cycle? So I'm going to ask the classes, and, and for those of you following, you feel free to share your guesses as well. But uh, I'll get a guess from each class, just one. So make a consensus among your group. But let's see, Sai, what do you think? How many of 2,000 eggs will come back to spawn again? Is that four fingers you're putting up? And four, <laughs> ten, four yeah. and 10. My guess four? is four, Daniel's guess is 10. Oh, OK, OK. So if we have. Ten four. Okay, let's see. Brooks, science. What? Okay, so what do you think? Like five. Five. Fifty. Five. Like fifty. Five. 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 250? Okay, we've got a big range here. I see some, some online, uh, some online guesses. No, oh, one class guesses 900 of 2,000. Another class guess 500. Someone guessed 20. So the answer is actually only one or two. So of those 2,000 eggs, 
maybe one or two. So one or two percent um, will only make it to the next generation to spawn again. So that's why they have to lay so many eggs just to ensure just one will will lay again. That's but crazy that's a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's crazy to think. But yeah, lots of uh, salmon don't survive their whole journey. There's, as you see, there's lots going on. So just highlighting again some of the threats. There's lots of change going on with our environment. So our, our systems are warming. The climate change um, is changing the habitats and the temperatures of the water, which are very specific. Um, there's lots of fishing going on. So everybody loves salmon. And, and sometimes there's overfishing. So a lot of the populations are in crisis right now. There's also different parasites or diseases out there that are impacting some of the, the juvenile salmon. Um, and they're not able to survive to adulthood. And then also lots of development going on. So in the poster, you saw lots of things that were being built along the riverbanks. And, and this takes away habitat, but also changes the, the temperature of the water and, and sediment goes into the streams and, and lots of things, lots of different things happen. So these are just some of the things um, that we're highlighting, but there are definitely lots more. And we're going to go more into kind of the conservation of it um, as we chat more in a different episode, focus on that. But these salmon are so important for the coast. They're considered our backbones. Um, so here is a dead salmon, but even when they're dead, they serve a really important role. So they break down, decompose, and go right into our coastal ecosystem. So this is a picture just depicting salmon um, in the soil because it breaks down and adds tons of nutrients um, and nitrogen, which is really limited on the coast or for plants. And so up to 80% of nitrogen um, of these plants come from salmon that live close to, to salmon bearing areas. And then the salmon also go into our trees. So some of these trees on our coast are the biggest and tallest because of that huge kind of nutrient pump into um, these systems. And so you can find isotopes of salmon if you test them along the riverbanks of, of salmon streams, but also they found isotopes of salmon in trees as far inland as the Rocky Mountains. Um, so it can make its way really far inland and put nutrients into these systems as well. All right, so the next slide. Um, oh, so salmon are really important indicator species, which means just looking at the health and population of these salmons can tell us a lot about the health of our ecosystems. Um, so if a population is, is in crisis, that means that the ecosystem could have a really big impact. And in turn as well, um, it impacts how the environment can support us. And so it's just certain things to think about. Um, and in the next slide, we have to think about our interconnections. So this is where it all kind of comes together. Uh, so we mentioned in our first episode that a watershed is an area where land um, collects water, any precipitation, and all these little streams and tributaries gather up to lakes and, and bigger waterways and then eventually the ocean. But we all live in these areas as well. So we live in watersheds and our homes also have water. So maybe we don't think too much all the time about where the water in our homes go, but they drain out and they go and lead somewhere. So a lot of our homes have drains that will go and the water goes to a treatment plant where it can help separate some of the larger things from the water and clean it, but it can't clean everything. And so things that dissolve in water or liquids or different chemicals um, can be really harmful if it joins in with other streams and then back to the ocean. So this next slide, very technical one, um, from the highly reviewed film, Finding Nemo, but it states all drains lead to the ocean. And there is, yeah, there's lots of things that we're all connected to. Um, but this next picture as well reminds us that all these drains lead to fish. So whatever goes down eventually leads to fish. So those you might have seen in sewage systems, um, the painted yellow fish, and that's to indicate that Whatever's going down there will link to fish. So I'm going to show this next slide. These are just things to really be aware of. So I'm just going to go through them um, 
to see if you recognize them. So this one is a biohazard. And so, yeah, so, <laughs> okay, we'll just go biohazard means it's, yeah, quite dangerous. This one is flammable. So anytime you see these products, these just indicate um, these type of things that could happen. So it could catch on fire. The next one is corrosive, which means it burns your skin. Uh, explosive, a lot of times they come in aerosol cans, um, which are really hard to, to break down in the environment. But yeah, they're very um, highly packed in there. This one is, maybe you might not recognize, it's, it's an environmental signal, warning signal, which means that anything that has this label um, can harm fish or harm the aquatic environments. This is a picture of pills or medication. Sometimes people um, don't realize what to do with them after they're done and they throw it down the sinks or they throw it and flush it in their toilets, which eventually dissolves and goes with their fish. Um, so fish don't need your medication, but there's definitely different ways to dispose of them. So you can always bring them back to the pharmacy um, or somewhere else. This one is acute toxic toxicity which means it can harm your lungs, your respiration, your skin, um, your eyes. And so it's something just to be aware of. And last but not least, hopefully everyone recognizes this, is poison or toxic. Um, and that is never to be consumed or drunken. Uh, and your fish don't need that as well. So all these symbols are warning you of what's in your products. And so take a look at what you're using to help clean your house, um, and think about alternatives of what we could use instead, maybe some eco-friendly products or DIY things you can make at home. So just as a, a highlight, um, I'm gonna show this video. I used to actually help teach salmon workshops with an organization called Stream of Dreams. Um, and they saw something that happened in nature and they made a difference. So I'm just gonna show the video to explain and then I'll just talk a little bit about that. Stream of Dreams began in the year 2000 when someone had put a poisonous substance into a storm drain and it wiped out all the fish in Burn Creek. There were over 5,000 fish that perished. And my daughter and I thought, well, maybe we could take Burn Creek and put it at the corner of Edmonds and Kingsway and let people know about what happened. So we uh, partnered up with the Burn Creek Stream Keepers and Joan Karn also became a founder. And we went into all the schools that were in the watershed and talked to the kids about the local watershed and how all the drains lead to fish habitat. And then they painted a wooden fish and we put them on the corner of Edmonds and Kingsway. And by River's Day, there were 1,300 fish on the corner of Edmonds and Kingsway. That is really how Stream of Dreams began. So when we first go into a classroom, um, the teacher or our educator will talk to kids about what their local watershed is, where their water comes from, where it's going, and also we mainly talk about how to prevent water pollution. Then okay. they come to um, an art. So yeah, you can talk to them now. But yeah, I just wanted to demonstrate. Um, I wanted to share that video just because it was something that someone observed in their community and maybe that person who, who poured down the chemicals didn't know um, it wasn't maybe it wasn't on purpose but it was something that was in a community that somebody recognized and they made a difference by starting stream of dreams to help educate others so it just goes to show you don't have to be uh, an expert you don't have to have tons of degrees or um, be someone super versed on something to try and make a difference. So you can just start wherever you want in your community, whatever you feel passionate about. And now that program has connected with so many different students about salmon and their connections all over all over Canada um, and across and across I think US as well. But if you ever go drive by these schools with the beautiful painted fish, that's that's just a reminder. 
of what happened. Um, so yeah, so that just leads me to conclude today with our student challenge. So every week we're, we're basically trying to promote people doing stuff in their community. So schools and groups, if you see something that's in your school or in your community that you feel passionate about or you think that you wanna raise awareness on, um, we'd love to hear about those projects and have you share it with us. And at the end of the year, we want to have a student celebration and platform to be able to outline and, and share with everybody else. And so we're, we're partnering with Take a Stand um, Foundation and Raincoast, we're partnering together to be able to showcase and share these events uh, with others. So if you have an idea or cause, you can share it in three different ways. So next slide, um, you can do a little video. It could be like a one or two minute video. You could do a presentation um, combined with a PowerPoint or anything that you want to do public outreach on. Or you can do a creative expression. So something that you have made, maybe like an art project or photography work or poem or song, um, whatever way you think that you would like to share something and just help educate people on, we'd love to hear it. And so you can learn more about that and, and email me if you want more information. But we always want to end with a positive note and just inspiring others that there's lots that we can do and um, we live in such a beautiful place that hopefully we can all do our part to protect it. But yeah, we are going to go to questions now. Um, so for anybody who has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat box. Uh, and I will go to the classrooms too, just to, to see if there's any last questions before we finish off. Let's see. I'll go to Sai just to start off. Do you guys have any questions? Silence. Oh, no more questions. Okay. If anyone in the comments has anything too, feel free to ask. Okay, let's go to McNair. Oh, I love a fish cut out. McNair, do you guys have a question? Yeah, just uh, two, two quick ones if we may. Uh, one is our, our city, uh, the city of Richmond, which is in an estuary is looking into making some salmon spawning uh, channels, like where we have old sloughs. We're, we're working to open them up to bring salmon back in to the estuary where some salmon can spawn. Do you know of any places uh, where this has happened uh, that we can look to and help promote so we can get this project uh, underway successfully here? And then the other question, earlier today, um, our class was looking in, into the, the story of the herring, the Pacific herring. And, and do you know if that fishery uh, started today? And, and are, do you, does your group uh, have some actions that we can take uh, to help the herring, which helps support all these other species? Oh, lots of very good questions. Um, I, I love the, the idea of you guys um, participating in, yeah, just opening up these estuaries and trying to bring back salmon. And so I know there's lots of different stream keepers um, throughout the lower mainland that I can help connect you with. And I can I can email you after with some of the names. Um, but they they all work on yeah rehabilitation with some of these habitats and and trying to get salmon back uh, into these ecosystems. But yeah, there's lots of different stream keepers. Um, and then in terms of herring, yeah, the herring season has just started. And so there's a lot, lots of focus on that right now and lots of highlight with understanding the herring fishery, uh, fisheries and what's happening. Um, so wrinkles, we're, we haven't focused too much on herring at the moment. We have uh, a lot of our conservations is around um, like salmon and, and killer whales, um, but there are lots of other organizations and I, I will come up with a list. These are really good questions. I have to, I'll come up with a list and, and share with everyone as well on our on our website or on our resources um, through email as well. But yeah, I love that you guys are taking action in your community in Richmond. And I'll be here to talk about herring too. It's so good to see um, the herring are back and doing pretty well this year. Mm -hmm. Hi. 
All right, I'm gonna go to, oh, so let's, okay. I think, Brooke Science, do you guys have any questions? What? Any questions? No. Oh, questions? Uh, no. Respect. Why was the guy holding the fish so long? Yeah. yeah. Okay, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a question here on our chat. Do salmon spawn in freshwater and saltwater? That's a good question. Um, so as far as I know, they spawn in freshwater. So they make their way back from the ocean and go up the river, the same river that they were born in, and they spawn in um, these little rock beds that they call reds, the nest sites. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining today. Um, if there are other questions, you can feel free to always email us. So next week's or next time episode uh, is a spotlight on harvesting. And we have with us, we're very fortunate to have a longtime Rain Coast team member. Um, he's an ultimate harvester from Healthsick First Nations. He'll share with us some stories and some of his uh, ways that he harvests different things. Um, and that is coming up on our next episode. Also, uh, I would like to give a kind of shout out and thank you to our sponsors for, for making this happen and getting us on air and, and everything else we need. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you everybody for joining you, joining us this week. And thanks to all the classrooms again for joining and hope to see you again next time. All right, bye everyone for now. Aliyah everyone.